the Honourable Member Kildon in St. Paul. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'll be splitting my time with the member for both. Um, Madam Speaker, the Canadian dream is dying and the Liberals are digging its grave. They've put us on an economic suicide mission that the world the Millennials are inheriting will be far different after their six years of their rule in this country than that of the baby boomers who preceded us, than that of our parents. And I'm very concerned about it and was very much looking forward to discussing the budget that they brought forward and the lack of vision and positive plan to create a future that Millennials can really believe in. So if we want to take housing, for example, housing has effectively doubled in price since the Liberal government took power six years ago. It is over $868,000 to buy a house today. And yet Canadians, my generation is the most educated generation in history. We have dual income households, both people working full time, and yet half of us will never be able to afford our own home. That's what the data is telling us. And in our parents' generation, let's, say, let's take the 1970s, the average income was about 25000 You could not have a formal post-secondary education, earn $25,000 a year, buy the average house price was about 50000 You can reasonably buy that house and pay it off within 10 years. And now again, my generation, the most educated in history, dual income household, half of us will never own a home. Something is seriously wrong with this picture. People depend on houses for their retirement. So what is half of my generation going to do about their retirement plans, Madam Speaker? We haven't heard a coherent plan from this government, but they are spending about $74 billion on housing since they took office and with their new promises in their budget. So one could argue perhaps their plan is making housing more expensive from the looks of it. And we know the parliamentary budget officer himself has said their liberal plan for housing will only have a limited impact. So again, not a lot to look forward to for millennials. And we know, we hear every day the interest rates are going up, they're going up. What does that really mean for your average homeowner? So if you've recently bought a house, let's say, let's take the average home price, $800,000, and you were lucky and you got in with the low interest rates at about 2%, you, had, you gave 5% down, you're probably paying about $3,400 a month with your mortgage. But let's say it goes up even just 3%, doesn't sound like a lot, but let's say your mortgage goes up 3% by the time you're up for renewal in a couple years. That will mean you're going to be paying about $5,200 a month. That's $22,000 more for the year that family with the average home price will be paying an interest payment. With $22,000 a year for a mortgage, that is catastrophic. That is families walking into the bank with their home keys, dropping them on the desk and saying, sorry, take it. I can't afford it. We can't afford it anymore. We're going to lose our equity. We can't afford this. It's very concerning, Madam Speaker, to hear these interest rates increases and the impact it will have on home ownership in this country. And we know the cost of living is going up as well, of course, driven in part and in large part by inflation. It hit 6.7% the cost of goods last month in March, which is a 30-year high. Inflation hasn't been this bad since before I was born, to put it into context. That's, that's what we've received as millennials and as Canadians now after six years of Liberal rule. We look at food and gas. Recent surveys show that a third of Manitobans say that they don't make enough to cover their bills. A third. One in three. And, two hundred, and half of Manitobans are only $200 away from not being able to afford their bills. They're going to go bankrupt. $200 away from, not be, from doors closing, can't pay the bills. Pretty astounding that half of Manitobans are only $200 away from that, Madam Speaker. And we know every time we bring this up, every time my colleagues work hard to bring up their legitimate grievances on behalf of their constituents who are struggling to afford food, struggling to afford gas, which was about a dollar a litre when the Liberals came in, now it's almost $2. Every time we bring it up, we get a bit of an eye roll. And we hear, oh, well, we're here for the people. We take care of them. We'll, we have Canada's back. I don't think so, Madam Speaker. It doesn't seem that way. When people can't afford groceries, you go to the grocery store, you pick up four modest bags of groceries. You're looking at a $300 bill. Imagine families of four, families of five. How are they affording this? Interest rates are going up. So if you car loan, credit loan, credit card, mortgage, all of it is increasing. More money just going to interest payments. And then so prices are going up, but what is their plan to grow the economy and to bring prosperity to the millennial generation and to all Canadians? Because I'm really not clear after reading the budget. 
And that's been actually a common criticism across the political spectrum. What is the vision? Because we know growth and investment have been way down since they took office. They have created an environment in Canada that people look at Canada, oh, no, I'm not investing in there. It's too, the regulatory burden is too high. We heard this even, I was listening to a podcast, Paul Wells, formerly of McLean's, was talking about in the budget, they even talk about uh, in the Liberal budget itself that growth over the next several years is projected to be lower than in the rest of the G7. Total spending on research and development has been declining in Canada, and it's the only G7 country where that's been happening. And that's what Mr. Wells brought my attention to in this podcast that I was listening to. So that's seven year, that's their record after about seven years of governance. The Fraser Institute as well said manufacturing capital stock is the lowest it has been in 35 years. The Fraser Institute also said that business investment dropped in seven of 15 sectors, critical sectors, economic engines of our country dropped since they've been in government. And I think Jack Mintz from the Financial Post put it quite well, Ottawa needs to recognize that Canada's economic potential depends on private investment, not government spending, if only they would recognize that, Madam Speaker. And if we look at the country's economic, the main economic engine, what brings in the most revenue more than any other industry, oil and gas. We know obviously we've heard lots about this, the No More Pipelines bill, the tanker ban, they've repeatedly bought, brought in major regulatory burdens so that Canada can't develop its natural resources and get them to market. It's been moving at a glacial pace. And yet we know that oil and gas brought in $700 billion in cumulative fiscal revenue to federal, provincial and municipal governments. $700 billion made from oil and gas given to government, that pays for health care, that pays for education, that pays for roads, that pays for our, general so our generous social safety net, Madam Speaker. And we talk about green investment. I am all for moving forward, greening our economy. I think most people are. But how are we going to get there? It's very expensive and the technology is not there yet. We need research and development dollars, which I just mentioned are declining. We need something to make the money so we can invest in these programs, invest in making our economy more green. And that's oil and gas, that's LNG. If we would just, if we would export our LNG gas and offset the world's dependence on coal, we could massively lower emissions, but we need a government with the will to make that happen. And we see countries like Norway leading the way in making their economy more green, aggressively pursuing also oil and gas development, working with their oil and gas for carbon capture technology. It's incredible what Norway is doing, green and oil and gas. And we've heard this government for six years talk about green jobs. I, I, I looked on Google for quite some time to try to figure out exactly how many green jobs they've created. Because we also heard this from the Kathleen Wynne government in Ontario, green jobs. Of course, their energy prices per household doubled in her time, in the Liberal time, in the Ontario provincial government. Much like what's happening with the federal Liberal government now with energy prices and household costs. And I can't seem to find any evidence of these green jobs. I, maybe someone can correct me and quote some data because I have not been able to find where these green jobs that they've been talking about for six, seven years, where are they? I would like to know and I'd like to see the data that says they're going to be as lucrative for Canada today as oil and gas has been for our social services, for our infrastructure. There's no evidence of this. Not to say it can happen, but they're not doing a great job. And then, so what does this create? Well, I think people forget, but Canada is a very difficult country to govern. We're the second largest landmass in the world. We have two official languages. We have over 300 First Nations communities. We have the East Coast. We have the West Coast. We have Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, the Prairies, then Ontario, Quebec, and the North. Difficult country to govern historically and today, but especially when the Prime Minister and his father were in power. We see Western alienation. We see Quebec separatism. This is what we're seeing. And I'm going to, and they know it. They know if they can focus the votes in the Toronto area, they don't have to pay attention to the rest of the country. We can see it in their policies. They don't consider what the West needs. And we saw Gerald Butts, former number one right hand person to our Prime Minister, he said, and I'll just quote and conclude, Madam Speaker. Uh, what you see here is a long-term optimization trend. Campaigns are ruthless optimization exercises where you will have incremental investment drive the maximum return in real time. We count seats, not votes, so smart campaigns focus on delivering them. They're winning elections on division, Madam Speaker. And I will end a quote with this. 
If governments can't demonstrate that their efforts work for regular people, then people will start to look around for other extreme alternatives. You know who said that, Madam Speaker? The Prime Minister in 2014 at a Liberal convention. Maybe he should listen to his own words. Madam Speaker, thank you. Questions and comments. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary of the Government House Leader. Yes, thank you. Madam Speaker, you know, as a Prairie Member of Parliament, I would suggest that the member is off base on a number of accounts. Yeah. You know, when, when the price of oil, the world price of oil was going down, mm -hmm. we were criticized because we were not allowing it to sustain itself. They wanted, the Conservatives wanted it to be higher. And today, the Conservatives are criticizing us because the price of world oil is too high. So when it's too low, it's the government's fault. When it's too high, it's the government's fault. When the member says, well, what about the need for, for oil production? Stephen Harper, absolutely not a drop of oil to the coastlines. We have at least put a pipeline that's going to the coastline, Mr. Speak Madam Speaker. I'm wondering if the member can recognize that just take a look at the real numbers, jobs, job growth. Take a look in terms of economic activity. Canada does exceptionally well, especially if you compare it to our neighbours in the south, the United States. My question to the member... Unfortunately, the honourable member is going on, and uh, there, I do have to allow for other questions. So the other, uh, the honourable member, uh, Kildonian St. Paul. Thank my honourable colleague from Winnipeg for his question. And I would say any, any Liberal who suggests that they support the oil and gas industry is living in a fantasy. All they need to do is look at the electoral map. No seats in the area of the country that generates some of the most economic wealth because they are consistently ignored, consistently abused by this Liberal government in their policies. So any, any indication, any, any words from any Liberal member of Parliament that they support our energy sector is a farce, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Mirabel. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would like to remind my Honourable colleague that we are independent, uh, we are sovereignists, irrespective of who's in power, even if it were to be the Conservatives. I'd like to note that she spoke a lot about housing, and I would like to note that the Conservatives have different proposals to ours, different to those of the government when it comes to housing. So that seems to imply that perhaps we should stop, and they should stop, imposing conditions in the budget. Perhaps the Liberals should just invest provinces with the money, because provinces understand their housing needs. Provinces are the ones with the plan, and they should be able to work as they wish to work. Wouldn't that be the best way to move forward? Then St. Paul. I thank the Honourable Member for his question. I think the answer to the housing crisis is that we simply need to build more houses more quickly. We need to ensure that federal dollars are incentivizing municipalities to build homes quicker. I think we need to be moving forward in our economy, making sure that if our econ economy is going to keep growing, if our population is going to keep growing, we need to ensure that our housing continues to grow as well. So I, I would ask the Liberal member, I, I know in his writing, he's, I'm sure he's having the same problem as I am, he's a similar age to me, half of our generation can't afford homes, they're spending $74 billion on housing, and yet housing prices have doubled since they've been in government. Something is going seriously wrong here, Madam Speaker, and it's unacceptable. Uh, questions et commentaires. The Honourable Member for Nanaimo, Lady Smith. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member for her speech. I agree that there are uh, many challenges being experienced by uh, many Canadians trying to make ends meet. Those particularly hard hit are those living with disabilities. They are being left behind. Uh, many in my riding of Nanaimo, Lady Smith, are concerned living with disabilities, trying to make ends meet, and the pandemic has made things even worse. Unfortunately, missing from the budget is, is the Liberals' long promised Canada disability benefit. Another issue is the barriers in those living with disabilities and accessing the disability tax credits. Does the member agree in the importance of this budget not leaving those living with disabilities behind and to finally implement the long-needed Canada disability benefit? The Honourable Member for Kildon and St. Paul. I thank the member for the question. I certainly uh, would appreciate a government who takes the needs of the disability community very seriously. I have, uh, I have many seniors in my riding who suffer from disabilities as well. And what I would say is that whenever we talk about inflation, whenever we talk about gas prices going up, heating prices going up, grocery prices going up, it impacts those on fixed incomes the most, those living with disability, those uh, seniors living on modest pension incomes. If you only have a fixed amount of money per month to pay for rent, transportation, uh, groceries, any increase in inflation, that hurts those folks 
the most. That's why every day we are railing on this government to do something about the cost of living because it is those who are in the lowest economic threshold who are dealing, who are suffering the most. It's a very serious issue. That's why we continue to raise them every day in question period, Madam Speaker.